Hi, welcome to Office Hours. My name is Patrick Curran, and along with Dan Bauer, we make up Curran Bauer Analytics. In this episode of Office Hours, I want to wrap up the topic on which we've spent a number of videos, which is growth curve modeling. And we have talked about a whole array of topics, including what is a growth curve model, how do you estimate it, how do you incorporate different functional forms of growth, how do you include predictors, a whole variety of things. What I'd like to do is wrap up this episode in talking about what are the general advantages and disadvantages of estimating a growth curve model within a multi-level modeling framework and within a structural equation modeling framework. These topics have come up over almost every video, and as I've commented on before, there are a number of situations in which, given particular characteristics of the data, the results of a growth curve model as estimated within a multi-level model and structural equation modeling are exactly the same. However, I've also alluded to differences in which the two approaches can lead to quite different uh, results and different access to different parts of the model and the parameters. So what I'd like to do is end with a general summary about which of these two approaches might be best for your particular application, depending on the characteristics of the data and the nature of the question that you're asking. So as a caveat going in, I fully realize that the last five or 10 years that there have been uh, a significant number of developments in quantitative methods and in software development, where the difference between a multi-level model and a structural equation model is harder and harder to determine. And indeed, for a broad class of models, the difference almost uh, lies at the level of software package of what is traditionally an MLM and what is traditionally an SEM. What I want to talk about today, it's a non-exhaustive list, it's not deterministic, it's not fixed, and um, it is really focused around these broader issues of, given a traditional approach, a standard approach to a multi-level model or a structural equation model, what are potential advantages and disadvantages that you might encounter? So to begin, let's briefly review what are the core components of a multi-level model and that of the structural equation model? So a multi-level model, it's often referred to as MLM for the multi-level model, or HLM, hierarchical linear model, mixed model, they tend to all refer to similar kinds of analytic approaches. These techniques were originally developed to handle nested data structures. So you had multiple children nested within a classroom, siblings within a family, patients within a physician, households within a neighborhood, wherever there were multiple observations that shared some kind of grouping uh, with one another as a function of some higher level uh, group membership, a, a school, a classroom, a hospital, whatever that might be. Now, the multi-level approach allows us to fit the growth curve models by applying that same concept, but at the level of the repeated measures. So instead of having, say, five children nested within a classroom, we conceptualize a growth model as having five repeated measures nested within an individual. So let's say that you go into my house and interview my mom when I'm 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 years old, and my mom fills out a checklist on my antisocial behavior, those five repeated measures are all nested within me because I'm the point, I'm the target, and you have five repeated measures that are nested within you. That's how we're gonna use these models to estimate the growth. So it conceptualizes the repeated measures as nested. And what this leads to is a data structure that is sometimes called long. You may have encountered someone talking about, well, is your data in long format or is it in wide format? This is the genesis of this. So what this means is, in the actual data file itself, each individual has a record of data. So remember, a record is just a line of data. Has a record of data for each person at each time they were assessed. So say I'm person one. So we have ID, I'm person one, and I was assessed at age 10, and I had some measure of antisocial behavior, whatever that was, I'll just put a check, that's some numerical value of that at age 10. Then you came back, I was assessed at age 11, 
I had a value. I, excuse me, I'm doing, this is actually the same. So ID, I'm the same at age 11. I'm same ID at age 12, and I have some numerical value of antisocial. But then we move to you, all right? So you're person two, you were assessed at age 10. Now, maybe you weren't assessed at age 11. You're away on vacation. The interviewer couldn't contact you. And so you have age 12 and you have some value. And this goes on for every person in the sample, for every assessment. That's why it's called a long format. And then without getting into the details here, we can build a level one equation, a level two equation, estimate the fixed and random effects that are associated with the regression of antisocial on age to get those trajectories in which we are interested. All right, so repeated measures are nested and the data is in what's called long format. Now, what is the structural equation model? Well, the structural equation model, or it's sometimes referred to as an SEM, is a very broad class of models that subsumes a whole lot of stuff that you and I are already familiar with. A t-test, ANOVA, multiple regression, multivariate regression, confirmatory factor analysis, a full structural equation model. All of these are forms of the general SEM. And the premise of the SEM and how it approaches the repeated measures is not that the repeated measures are nested within an individual. Instead, the repeated measures represent observed indicators that define an underlying latent factor. And those latent factors represent the growth trajectories. It's latent in the sense that we didn't directly observe the trajectory, but we're going to infer its existence as a function of what we did observe, which are the repeated measures. So the repeated measures are multiple indicators. All right, so they're multiple indicators on a latent factor, and we've covered a lot of this in prior videos. But the data file here is what's called wide. All right, so instead of having one record of data for each person at each observation, there's instead just one record of data for each person. And the columns of that data file are each assessment of the variable. So let's say we're back to my data. So I'm kid one. Now remember we had age 10, age 11, age 12, and then we had antisocial at age 10, 11, and 12. All right, and for me, at age 10, I was 10, and at 11, I was 11, at 12, I was 12, and then I had some value of antisocial, 11, 12, 10, 11, and 12. Now, your data comes in. Now, remember, you were assessed at age 10, but you were on vacation at age 11, and so that's a missing data point. You were there at 12, and so you had a value of antisocial at 10. You have a missing value at 11, and you had a value at 12, and then it goes on for the full sample. This, in this way, notice we have these standalone measures of antisocial at 10, 11, and 12, is we can use antisocial 10, antisocial 11, antisocial 12 as multiple indicators on this latent factor. We've talked a lot about these in prior videos if you've happened to see those. So here you can see why it's in wide format is the general rule is any repeated measure is used as an observed indicator to define an underlying latent factor. Now, that's a whirlwind tour of the two approaches. So what are the common points? All right, because there's a broad class of models that under certain conditions, if you use a multi-level model, and again, we're working on standard ones, but a multi-level model is defined in, or is estimated in any standard software package, whatever that might be, and you estimate the model, uh, the growth model in the multi-level, and then you repeat it in the structural equation model, and you compare the results, they're numerically isomorphic. They're not similar, you wouldn't write the same discussion, it's not kind of the same, they're numerically indistinguishable. So what are those conditions, all right? Well, there are three conditions generally that we need to meet where the MLM and the SEM are identical. One is where we have sufficient sample size, all right? I'm gonna say N for sample size. 
all right? What is sufficient? I have no idea. It varies from application to application. It depends on the quality of your measure. It depends on the sampling frame. It depends on the, the strength of the fit of your model. But we need a large enough sample size where the large sample properties of maximum likelihood kick in within the structural equation model and then the, the parallel version within the multi-level. Strictly making up a number is maybe 75 observations, 100 observations, um, you start moving into a sufficient sample size. But don't write that down. That's just, uh, it depends because 50 observations with three repeated measures is very different than 50 observations with 10 repeated measures. So it's a complicated uh, uh, distinction to make, but you need sufficient sample size to invoke the large sample properties of maximum likelihood. The second, is you need a sufficient number of observations for each repeated measure or at each repeated measure. So remember, in the structural equation model, any repeated measure is a variable in the model. It has a mean, it has a variance, and it has a covariance with all other repeated measures. So you need a sufficient number of observations at each possible time point to stably estimate those sample statistics. So if you only have one individual who is assessed at age 12, you can't estimate a variance for that or a covariance. So again, how many sufficient observations? I have no idea. Um, I have seen applications that have had as few as uh, five or six or eight, but you know, typically you might want 10, maybe 20, I don't know. That's a case by case distinction. Then the third one is you need no nesting um, beyond the repeated measures, all right? So what that means is we have the multiple observations, the multiple repeated measures nested within individuals. The individuals themselves cannot be part of a higher order nesting. We can't have multiple repeated ob observations within kids and then kids within classrooms or patients within doctors or households within neighborhoods, whatever it, may, it might be. What we, another way of stating this is the individuals that we're studying, so me and you and the rest of us in the sample, they're independent, is that there's no higher order structure to the data. So when you have a sufficient sample size, efficient number of observations at each repeated measure, and you don't have higher nesting, so the individuals are independent, there are a broad class of models where the multi-level and the SEM are identical. They're identical in every way. And we've talked a lot about these in prior videos. The unconditional univariate growth model, so where we have a linear or we have a quadratic or we have a piecewise trajectory, um, that we don't have any predictors in. We just get a mean and a variance of the intercept. We get a mean and a variance of the slope. Do that in SEM, do that in MLM under these conditions, they're identical. Um, we can incorporate time invariant covariance, biological sex, treatment condition, self-identified ethnic group membership. Is we regress the intercept and slope on those, those are identical results. We expand the univariate model to include time-varying covariance, where remember we use an example where we had alcohol use as the dependent variable, and we use delinquent behavior as the time-varying covariate. Those are isomorphic. Expanding to a bivariate model, where we estimate a growth process for one construct, a growth process for another, and tie the latent factors together with a covariance structure, those are numerically identical. So there's a broad class of these models where they're indistinguishable. Um, we have put a couple of citations uh, along in the notes to this video so that you can read more details about exactly where those are. But these are the conditions that we invoked when in prior videos I said, now we can do this in either the MLM and SEM, but I won't talk about it here. This is why, all right? So those are the points where the MLM and SEM are equivalent. But where do they differ? Where do they separate? Now again, these are broad descriptions. There are no, they're not as clearly uh, defined as uh, 
what I'm going to lay out here, but this is just simply broadband considerations for you to think about as you're thinking about applications in your own data for your own research. So we'll start with the MLM. Under what conditions is the MLM uniquely well suited to handle in the growth curve modeling? Well, the first one that we can think about is if there is higher order nesting. All right. So let's say that we have repeated measures that are nested with an individual, and those individuals are children who themselves are nested within classroom. So you would have a three level data structure where you have repeated measure nested within kid, kid within class, and we could build a fascinating model where you have characteristics of the time at the repeated measures, characteristic of the kid, but also characteristic of the teacher. And so what type of child develops more rapidly in end of grade testing um, as a function of teacher characteristics, school characteristics, things like that. We could have repeated measures of children nested within families and look at parent level effects. We could have pre and post operative measures of pain of patients who are nested within hospitals. Some hospitals might be teaching hospitals, some hospitals are private hospitals. Are there hospital effects that influence the patient recovery from some kind of surgical intervention? So those are three level examples, but there are more complicated things. We can have things called cross-classified models where there are two levels of, of nesting where you might belong to one but not the other, you might belong to the other but not the one, or you might belong to both at the same time. There are things called multiple membership models that are similar kinds of, of structures in their complexity. But the point is, is the multi-level model is naturally suited to take the growth of the repeated measures within individual and then expand it uh, up to higher levels of nesting. A second advantage is the estimation of models um, with small sample size. All right, small n. <laughs> Again, just like I wouldn't commit to a value being a large n, I won't commit to a value being a small n. I don't know what small is. Um, there are some published applications with growth models as small as 12 or 14 individuals. That's getting pretty small, but if you're talking 20 or 30 or 40, something like that, these small sample advantages come online. The reason is, is that for reasons we won't discuss here in the structural equation model, they use um, what's sometimes called full information maximum likelihood and or just large sample maximum likelihood, which is derived under asymptotic conditions. So it assumes large sample sizes. And the performance of that begins to deteriorate as the sample size gets smaller and smaller. In the multi-level modeling framework, there's a, an estimator called restricted maximum likelihood. And this has certain advantages and disadvantages to itself, but it behaves much better under smaller sample size conditions, particularly in the estimation of random variance components. And often that's what we are more interested in. So in smaller n, um, that is an advantage itself. Now, a third place where there's an advantage here is um, if you have highly variable um, assessments. All right, so let's say you're doing kind of a diary data and you're randomly pinging cell phones. And it may be that throughout a day that no individual in the sample has exactly the same uh, assessment schedule. So I was pinged at 9.11 a.m., 11.30 a.m., and 1.12 p.m., and you were pinged at 8.22 a.m., and then 8.48 p.m., and then 1.06 p.m. You and I have completely different assessment schedules. If that happens over all the individuals, that's a real problem for the structural equation model. Because remember, any observed repeated measure has to stand alone as an indicator variable on a latent factor. And if you only have one or two or a very small number of individuals at any given assessment, then that's a problem with the SEM. 
for reasons we won't go into details here, that same problem doesn't hold within the multi-level, and it comes from the fact that we're just treating those time assessments as nested within individual, as opposed to being standalone variables within the model. And then the final uh, characteristic of study characteristic where the multi-level is very well suited for these kinds of models are large numbers of repeated measures. So what that means is, let's say, again, that we're doing a diary data, all right, we're doing a diary study, and we might have five assessments per person per day for a month. And so we have a very large number of repeated measures that we want to use in our growth model. But within the structural equation model, every one of those has to be an indicator on a latent factor. Well, you can very rapidly find yourself in a situation in the SEM where you have a growth factor that's defined by 50 indicators or 100 indicators. And again, for reasons we won't explore here, that's very challenging, if not impossible, for the structural equation model to deal with. So sometimes the term you get here is intensive longitudinal designs. And what that is, is instead of a more traditional kind of panel model where you have, you know, one or two or 300 people that are followed over five years or three years or six years, is that flips it on its head a little bit and you have a smaller number of people, maybe 25 people, but there are 100 repeated measures and so it's intensive longitudinal designs. So these are four very broad categories where the multi-level model might offer you some strength and flexibility in your own applications is more complex nesting, smaller sample sizes, if you have these highly variable assessments over time, and a large number of repeated measures. And as you can imagine, the battles get harder to fight when you start crossing some of these, right? As if you have a smaller N in this intensive design, you have a little bit smaller N, you have more variable assessments, and you tend to have a large number of repeated measures. Those all occur at the same time, and that makes it even progressively more difficult for the SEM. All right, so let's think about the SEM though for a moment, because it is a very powerful approach that also offers a variety of advantages that you might want to consider. So where does the SEM come to, to have some advantages over the multi-level model? The first one, and this is a little bit of a double-edged sword, is within the SEM, you get local and global measures of fit, of model fit. So for those of you who have done SEM yourself or have read or been a consumer of it, it's very common to see for any given model, what is the chi-square, the RMSEA, the CFI, the TLI, the IFI, the RNI, there are dozens of these indices. Some are omnibus that are based directly on the likelihood ratio test. Some are called um, relative indices of fit where you compare the improvement of model to some baseline. Some are called absolute measures of fit. That's like the RMSEA where you compare the fit of your model to a saturated model. There are a whole variety of these. And then there are also things called Lagrange multipliers or modification indices that says if you were to free this parameter or introduce this parameter, your model would improve and fit by this much. You have a whole host of these measures um, that are available to you that by and large are not available within the multi-level model. Now, it's a double-edged sword because in some ways this is advantageous in that you can estimate a particular model and you can build a story about the appropriateness of fit, about the chi-square, the RMSEA, fit indices, and so on. But it, it is also a bit of a limitation because many of these model fit indices compare your hypothesized model to some model that we're really not interested in some null independence baseline model or some saturated model. And um, the multi-level model doesn't have access to these same measures of fit, 
but um, you are then prompted to do more model building, model comparison. So you start with a model and then you expand it and compare it and expand it and compare it. So that's advantageous in that way. Um, a second uh, group of, of models where this is highly advantageous, advantageous is in multivariate. So um, we talked about some of these in a prior video. How do you link two constructs as they unfold over time together? So you have growth in alcohol use, growth in delinquent behavior. The multi-level model can do certain forms of these, um, but as you begin to introduce more complex structural relations, lagged relations, bidirectional relations, the SEM, these are just simply introduced as new parameters in the model in a very natural way, and the multivariate, excuse me, the multi-level model is less well suited to introduce those, and at one point it's not possible the way that the model is, is uh, defined and estimated. A third is the SEM, and this is one of the unique strengths of the SEM in general, but also with respect to the growth curve model, is you can estimate latent factors. All right. So we've seen one set of latent factors in that we're estimating a latent intercept and a latent slope to get our, our growth part of the model, but we can incorporate those in any part of the model. So if we have predictor variables that uh, uh, we had you know, some exogenous covariate of self-esteem, as instead of adding up the items and dividing how many we have and using it as a manifest variable, we could estimate a multiple indicator latent factor that um, introduces a more psychometrically principled uh, expression of our, our construct of interest. So we could estimate multiple indicator latent factors on, on the exogenous side as predictors, but also as our repeated measures ourselves. So, or themselves, excuse me, is, um, for example, everything that we've talked about, alcohol use, antisocial behavior, end of great testing, we've all assumed that those have just been measured with manifest variables, just means or proportions, whatever they might be. But at each age, we could estimate a multiple indicator latent factor to um, estimate and remove the negative effects of measurement error that might exist. And so that's a, a significant advantage. And then the fourth one we saw a little bit in the multivariate video, which is um, the testing of complex mediation. So uh, in the SEM, it is uniquely well suited to test causal chains of, of variables. So A leading to B leading to C leading to D. And we can get a whole host of tests of, uh, they're called indirect effects. We can get specific indirect effects. We can get total indirect effects. But the, the structural equation model, say you're, you're evaluating the impact of a treatment condition and you want it to know what is what are the mediating influences that link the treatment to some distal outcome of uh, reducing the probability of arrest or an onset of an alcoholism diagnosis. And the growth factors serve as mediators. So the treatment alters trajectory of high-risk behavior that in turn decreases the probability of some later arrest or diagnostic onset or something like that. So these are kind of four characteristics of a design or data or hypotheses where the SEM would be well-suited um, to examine. So to reiterate, and, and I apologize if it's excessively redundant, this is not exhaustive, this is not fixed, this is not locked down. These are just broadband. If you're considering your hypotheses, if you're considering the nature of your data, you're considering what of the two approaches might best suit your particular needs, these are things that you can consider in your decision making. So, as always, thank you so much for your time. Dan and I really appreciate it. Take care.